Hello, everyone. Welcome to our discussion on modernizing your MarTech stack to drive engagement, growth, and customer satisfaction. I'm Alex Goral, your moderator for today's session, and I'm thrilled to have each of you joining us. Throughout this web exclusive webinar, we'll explore how MarTech is the enabling technology that allows you to understand your customers and create omni-channel personalized experiences that matter. Whether you're here to gain insights, take next steps, or simply are curious about the topic, I'm confident you'll find today's discussion both engaging and informative. Before we get started, a few quick housekeeping notes. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A and we'll address them at the end of the session. We'll be sharing a special offer to all of our attendees and you'll also receive a copy of the slides and access to the recording. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Carlos Pimenta, with 33 years of experience, Carlos, the Vice President of Customer Experience, specializes in digital experience transformation, helping clients transform and grow their businesses across various sectors. He has a proven track record of driving growth and operational efficiencies leading teams that deliver compelling consumer experiences, including Fortune 500 brands. Will Payman, as Senior Director of Strategy, CX at Synoptic, leading the digital strategy and analytics discipline for various clients across different industries. He supports clients and digital strategy activities and deliverables, including competitive analysis, opportunity assessment, current state assessments, and strategy development. And Jay Ken, the Chief Technology Officer of Customer Experience at Synoptic, is responsible for developing and implementing technology and applications. He keeps our firm on top of the technological wave and carefully monitors industry trends and developments to make informed decisions about how new technologies can best serve Synoptic and its clientele. In our agenda today, we'll be going through the growing MarTech landscape, deconstructing the MarTech stack, selecting your MarTech stack, how AI is changing MarTech, lessons learned and best practices, and then we'll wrap up with Q&A with our experts. I invite Carlos to get us started. All right, great. Thank you, Alex. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, let's start off a brief introduction on, on Synoptic. We are a global systems integrator that helps companies effectively harness technology to achieve their business goals. Our solution, uh, our three solution group areas, digital customer experience, digital enterprise and cloud and uh, infrastructure work closely together to deliver value to our clients on a day to day basis. The, the group that I lead, the digital customer experience uh, team, works with IT, marketing, commerce, and customer service uh, clients to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of their customer-facing digital initiatives. As you can see, uh, we go to market with a uh, fair number of, of partners that, that, that you would expect and more that have been or not on that list. And uh, across uh, industries, we, we serve clients across many industry verticals, but the ones that are listed on the screens are the ones that we have the most uh, expertise in and experience in uh, from financial services, healthcare, life sciences, energy, nonprofit, retail manufacturing, and, and uh, et cetera. We'll start by going into the growing MarTech landscape. Uh, as you, most of you are probably already aware of, uh, MarTech is simply an abbreviation for marketing technology. It refers to the software suite that companies use to market, engage, convert, and serve their customers. And they fall into several categories, from advertising to content and experience, which really is obviously the hub of uh, all engagement with customers, social, commerce and sales, data insights, etc. And marketing today is increasingly digital and it powers every step of the digital customer journey. After all, most customers seeking to learn more about a company and its products will turn to their, their, their phone, mobile phone, or to a browser and go to the web and start to learn more, find a, a, a company that, that offers a solution to what they need is, so they can learn more about their offering, evaluate whether they want, they want to do business with them, 
to buy the products that they choose to, to buy at that point in time, and then onboarding customer all the way through to problem resolution from customer service. The types of MarTech stacks that uh, support that is everything from ad service to customer data platforms where we track the customer uh, activity, CRMs, uh, content managers, personalization engines, engines, and the list goes on. The marketing tech technology uh, landscape is a frequently cited source of the rapid growth of, of, of MarTech. And in its maiden year in 2011, only 150 technologies were identified. Since its inception, it has a grown at a remarkable 42% CAGR and is expected to exceed 14,000 offerings in 2024. The growth has been staggering. It is really getting really hard to, to visualize this. It, it gets increasingly more myopic every year. In terms of what's driving uh, MarTech modernization or the growth in MarTech modernization, let's start off where, um, the, with the audience, right? Customers live busy lives and it takes seconds to decide whether your message is relevant to them. We expect companies today to know our needs, remember our interactions across channels, be relevant in messaging and offers, and also be easy to do business with. The great customer experience is no longer nice to have, it's table stakes. And if your message does not connect in seconds, you've lost a potential customer. Meeting those needs today requires a more sophisticated marketing approach. And then looking at uh, the companies themselves, uh, companies exist to grow and serve their customers and companies invest in MarTech because they, they, they are obviously wanting to get a competitive advantage over their customers to be more visible and provide more relevant messaging. Given the highly competitive landscape, the com companies that, that will lose market share if they don't have the right, the right type of MarTech tools, talent and strategies and tactics to find new customers, convert, convert them and keep them. And then finally, technology consent co continues at a uh, aggressive disruptive rate. The pace of adoption speeds up when there are tangible benefits for both customers as well as companies. And technologies that give companies a competitive advantage to acquire and serve customers more effectively will always be in demand. And today, Martech, modern MarTech tools are being infused with AI to increase productivity as well as marketing effectiveness. In the previous slide, I spoke about the modern uh, you know, pace of technology evolution. And in MarTech, uh, research shows that the sweet spot in replacements is currently a three to five year window. I was actually surprised when I, when I read this. It's not necessarily replacing the whole uh, stack, which was what was occurring in the, in the, in the past, but certainly components of it. Um, that's industry innovation for work at, at work for you. What is interesting that it's no longer about moving away from homegrown solutions, but commercial applications replacing other commercial applications 70% of the time. The reasons listed are in priority order on your right hand side, but certainly at the top is providing a better customer experience, providing better capabilities from the MarTech stack itself, which improves the marketing effectiveness, and obviously the data centralization, which is a common pain point together with integration that we see with our customers. And, uh, you know, we expect the trend to continue as the AI value proposition uh, increases. And then finally, this is an interesting slide from uh, eMarketer that corroborates the chief MarTech's uh, research of a three to five year replacement window. We are resigned to expect these days that marketing spend will continue to rise year over year, as you can see by those uh, increasing bar charts. But if you look at the spend change percentage uh, depicted by the red line, it reflects spending growth during the pandemic that understandably eased off in subsequent years. Uh, from 2021 all the way down to 2023, but now we're seeing a trajectory where there's increased focus on um, uh, re-evaluating MarTech stacks. And it's in line with the three to five year replacement window, which is, is good to see that type of alignment within uh, the different uh, reports that are out there. At this point, I'll hand over to Will Payment to talk about deconstructing the MarTech stack. Thank you, Carlos. Um, so when we look at the MarTech stack, we think about it in 
five major areas. Now, you saw there was a list of 14,000 options. There are other domains, but today we're going to focus on content, commerce, digital marketing, customer data, and analytics. Um, not covered today, but we could have further sessions on user advertising and digital media tools, social media tools, and a lot around the content operations, so project management and production tools. Okay, let's talk a little bit about content. So content is the primary experience for most businesses, right? The ability for sales and marketing teams to manage websites, landing pages, microsites are common across many businesses. Content management tools platform, sorry, were the primary platform of managing. But what we're seeing is this incre increased sophistication and needs across multiple business to ma manage the manage um, content. So for example, it's not just managing the end of the product, of the end of the, the content on your website. We're also looking at things like workflows, right? Um, more and more of our customers are, are want to automate. They want to apply different roles. They want to have reviews. I mean, who hasn't here said, hey, I've wrote this marketing copy, it, and it has to go through my management, and it has to be approved by legal. Automating that and putting into a workflow is a, new, a common capability that customers now want to put in. Digital asset management is another one we've seen growth in. You know, it, it started off with if um, your content was fairly dynamic, fairly limited. Now we're seeing companies managing thousands of assets, whether it's videos or data sheets um, or audio. This content has to be managed and it's frequently shared with your agents, with agencies, with other third parties. And the ability to manage, organize, and make sure you always have the latest versions is becoming critical. Multi-site management is something we see, particularly in growth companies. Um, when you do acquisitions, the ability to manage multiple brands um, across multiple regions is a really core capability. This has been difficult in some legacy systems because what you see is multiple CMSs being used for each brand. Ideally, what you want to do is try to bring those together and manage them under a single tool. Multi-language, global growth is another area we've seen. Customers looking to grow their businesses by entering new markets and they need to be able to manage uh, multiple languages. So you've got multi-brand and multi-language tends to go hand in hand, but again, capabilities to be able to manage from a single platform, these different experiences. And then integrations. Integrations into content management, again, tend to be sort of was fairly basic, but now we're trying to pull data from various ERP systems and other third-party systems. And this, and this is the capability that our, our customers are looking for. Now, we had a company, uh, a client who was an HVAC customer. So HVAC, you think, well, that's not a really digital brand. But what they saw was they had 14 different brands and they needed to manage them all under the one platform. So this is really the site consolidation play. Um, they were finding themselves creating multiple repetitive, repetitive versions of the same content. At one point, we saw a blog article that was recreated 14 times because of this sort of broken, independent um, um, infrastructure. So each brand was brought together, put on a single platform. They all could have the best capabilities. They could share content, and they could share best-in-class experiences. The next area is commerce. Um, Gartner was predicting that in, in the B2B space, that by 2025, 80% of all B2B sales and interactions will start with a connection through digital and even have a, the transaction become through the digital experience. Now, we all know that B2C is a growth area. The pandemic proved that customers will come online, are looking online, and want to transact online. So, like a lot of, like the content story, what we're seeing is that a lot of companies we work with start with a very basic shopping cart experience, right? But now they're looking for different types of experiences and improving that commerce experience. There's been a wave of innovation within payment gateways. You start thinking about how you pay for goods and services these days, whether it's using virtual wallets or these payment items like Klarna and other sort of micro loan uh, and microfinancing solutions. This one really, this really drives adoption, but it also changes the way that customers behave with you. We've seen growth in order management, um, the ability to 
uh, to manage those orders across multiple ERP systems. We've seen catalog growth, product information growth, the promotion management, very important for e-commerce marketers, the ability to manage those performance and make sure you're not overpaying to acquire your customers or spending too much on um, you know, your promotional dollars. Clearly customer management, figuring out who are your customers that buy, when do they buy, what do they buy, why do they buy it? So those customer insights, customer management integrations um, to your CRM systems. And then like, uh, like content, commerce is increasingly more connected. We've seen, a, we started out with very much standalone types of systems. Now we're seeing a lot of demand for integration into different ERPs um, for the, that global growth and growing your commerce platform across, uh, across your, your digital footprint. Now we've, we've had several experiences We're working with a, a man, manufacturers, and these are really looking to provide commerce platforms uh, for their um, for their distributors. What we saw from our customer was one of their biggest clients was actually demanding that they have a modern e-commerce platform to be able to do business. So this became an, you know, a strategic goal from the IT group and also from the sales group to make sure that this customer was serviced with a modern, with a mo modern e-commerce platform. Now this, modern, this platform was designed to scale to support multiple customers, multiple customer types, as well as multiple languages and multiple territories. Um, the next area is digital marketing. No doubt a lot of you are here because of your sort of marketing backgrounds, but we've seen a growth in this space. You saw many tools. A lot of it's been driven by the different types of um, marketing, tool, uh, marketing technologies. Now, we start with things like campaigns. Email is the, the, still the key and the leader in the campaign, but campaign management, thinking about marketing automation platforms, the integrations with CRMs, commerce, and, and then with your CMS. Personalization engine, this is again a growth area, um, looking at customers' attributes, activities, and placing the right offer in front of them. In the commerce space, the recommendation engine area is growing. Um, this has been infused with AI and other technologies to improve the recommendations that customers put in front of them. Um, form management, this is a, I know this is a pain for a lot of marketers, right? That ability to collect data, take that data and share it into a marketing system or a CRM system is really through the ease of use of those sort of form management. So creation of new forms, management of those forms and integrations into systems. Site search is another pain point, but again, a huge customer demand. Uh, we're seeing, you know, if we look at any of this heat map with a lot of our clients, search is the first place that people go to. And they expect a search, site search experience that gives them the right answer at the right time. SEO, again, a lot of concern about this. As search changes, SEO is still important. Um, in terms of making sure those that technical SEO as well as that content SEO is driving your customers to the right pages and getting you higher visibility in the search rankings. And then finally, there's really the sort of the omni channel, right? Marketers today aren't just managing a single channel. They have to manage the outbound channels, whether it's SMS, social media, email, push marketing, but also manage the content, the website, the commerce platforms. So there's a lot of things that go along here. And you, what we're looking to do is to try and get the right message to the right customer, but now the trick is also in the channel that they'll react. And with the tools are now starting to make it easier for customers to be able to understand those customers' but journeys and decide which channel you wanna to talk to your customer in. Now, we've had a, we have a customer that's really had a hard time with rolling out some of their marketing and their segments, but we've been introducing tools and platforms to them to really help them target the right customers and prospects with unique offers in order to drive that conversion and loyalty. We've, we've gathered the requirements, we found various, we've reviewed multiple different systems and made a recommendation. We're now in the process of launching a, a personalization and omni-channel um, campaign delivery system um, that will give them targeted campaigns and as well the ability to test, A-B test um, those campaigns.
customer data. Um, we hear this a lot, that one of the biggest challenge is bringing all that customer data together. When you think about where customer data lives in most enterprises, it tends to be in all these different silos. You can have it in customer databases, right? You can have it in financial systems. You can have customer service systems. And the integration of these data, this, this customer data into a single platform has been a challenge that many of our customers have faced. Now, what we've seen is various different types of technologies are used whether it's the marketing automation system, the customer relationship management, or, the, or a customer data platform. Um, we're bringing that customer data together is really part of that transformative project. Now, once we get that data together, how can we use it? Now, what you're seeing is things like content management, creation of new segments, persona types, um, activity tracking, the lead scoring, right? We think about the, the likelihood that this customer is going to um, uh, go to convert or, or going to leave, right? So that lead scoring could be used in different ways to think about churn analysis and conversion analysis. And then ultimately, there's more and more integrations, right? Whether it's with your advertising systems, your CRM systems, your ERPs, and your customer service systems. Now, we have a client that is faced exactly with these challenges. Diverse data all over the, 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 uh, the different departments, different uses, different views. And what we've, this, what we've worked with them to do is use a customer data platform as a way to bring all this data together. Once we have this data together, we are then triggering experiences, targeting offers, and looking at the different channels um, to be able to produce a differentiated experience based on the context of what the customer has done, what the customer, what products the customer owns, and, and the potentially the state of where the customer is in, in terms of the mindset. Uh, the next area is analytics. Now, we know that most of you out there, you probably think, well, we have analytics covered, we have Google Analytics, right? We know that GA4 is out there and customers are sort of moving into that and using some of the new capabilities. This is a real, you know, the typical kind of experience. But this tends to be sort of typical web experience, web analytics and reporting. But where we're seeing the sort of improvement is moving from away from a kind of a historical look back web analytics to more of this customer journey analytics, where we're looking at real time issues that are being you know, real time issues and concerns that the journeys that customers are taking. Now, what we're seeing is things like heat maps, journey flows. We're seeing this live replays. Now, when we have this kind of technology in the customer uh, journey, map, journey analytics, it's, very, it's a whole lot easier to understand the whys. Why did the customer abandon this process? What was the barriers? What are the friction points? And because of the data, now in these newer platforms, platforms like Quantum Metric and Full Story, we can, and, and Heap, we can take that data and we can actually say, this many customers are affected by this experience. This gives a lot more insight to, our, to um, your dev teams, your product management teams, and your, your business owners about where those problems are and allows them to prioritize what are the things that need to be fixed, when do they need to fix them, right? You've probably all been in that experience where you go, you hear from the call center, there's a problem. Your team spends maybe a couple of days trying to figure out what is the cause of that problem to try to repeat what was reported. Well, think about customer journey analytics. You have that ability to pull up the sessions, count the number of sessions, see how many are affected, find out who those customers were, and then decide, is this something we need to fix immediately? Or is this was just sort of one of those things that was a moment in time, or this is an ongoing problem? Other areas where analytics is, is growing is around campaigns, campaign performance. A-B testing is becoming a key tool and capability for all organizations to be able to look at conversion. And then don't forget about the, the, uh, the qualitative data. A lot of these systems today, very much the quantitative data. It's very easy to put a number on it. But getting the, the adding in the VOC, customer interviews, and other qualitative data, again, fills out that picture of what the customer is doing and gives the teams much more insights into customer behavior. Now, we had a, we worked with a customer, a transportation customer, 
that wanted to figure out how their customer portal was being used and what were the issues with it. So we deployed a customer journey analytics platform that very quickly showed us these were the main paths through the site. They showed us the, the, the pain points and gave us a prioritization of the things that needed to be fixed. Now, this prioritization allowed us to focus resources on making those fix. And what we saw was an increase in satisfaction. We saw an increase in number of users. And we also saw a significant drop in call center volume. There was a lot of call center problem volume beforehand asking for things like password resets or how do I do various things. Once we identified those, put some automations in place, put some training in place, those numbers drastically reduced. Okay, so let's talk about how do we select a MarTech stack. Now, when you think about a MarTech stack, it, you're thinking about a technology that you want to live with for the next two or three years, maybe a little longer, and also give you capabilities that you have today, but also allow you to expand and improve. So I'm going to focus really on the first couple of steps because I think these are the things that we've noticed that, that our customers really skip. They sort of go straight to this is the features we want and then go to implement. But if you think about how critical a MarTech system is, you probably should go through a much more rigorous process. So the way we look at it is we like to think about a current state. Let's understand the company, how the company performs today, what those goals are, what's the vision for their future, their current platforms, processes, people, and skills. Once we've done that, we really focus on a future state. Now, this is probably very hard to do on your own um, because unless you have a sort of a vast experience of what's possible, it's very limiting. But what we, we look at is the idea of using tools like customer journey maps or service blueprints to sit down with our clients and co-create the future. What is the experience we want to deliver next year, in three years, or maybe even 10 years? Let's think about that future. Think about the channels. Think about the data. And then this will give us a, an ability to say, these are the capabilities we want, and then use that to benchmark against vendor offerings. Your vendor selection process is, again, very important. We leverage those requirements. We focus on which are the tools. And then we would recommend doing a proof of concept. Now, most vendors will, most MarTech vendors will do that. You know, if you can give them a scenario, give them some data, they'll, they'll be able to create a proof of concept. Work with your agency, work with your partner to the, develop what are those proof of concepts. And then this give, gives us an opportunity to see how it would work, but also how it is easy is it to set up? How easy is it to manage? What does the reporting look like? Okay. So once you have that proof of concept, you've selected your tool, I would say next thing is your feature backlog, you implement, you do your QA and UAT. Don't forget things like, you know, test, asking your, your custom, your employees, as well as your, your customers, consider usability testing. Um, and also, you know, for both your end users and your customers and your employees, I mean, um, launch, think about a, a process of once it's launched, what's next? Think about that continuous improvement. This is where journey analytics comes in, right? The ability to understand, we put it in place. Did it behave the way we expected to, it to take, to, to um, perform? If not, why not? What were the issues? And then don't forget training and adoption. Your employees are going to be key. You employ that, if you deploy a new system and your employees do not adopt or do not use, then you're not going to get the outcomes you had planned way back when you were thinking about the future state. So how do you know where you are? Well, like a lot of companies, we have a very simple, simple sort of uh, MarTech mon um, maturity model. Uh, we tend to look at these four different stages, right? We have initial, developing, you know, up to optimize. We tend to think about a description, the characteristics, the type of capabilities, and the kinds of goals. So when you're thinking about where are you, put yourself on the map. This is a really good way to summarize, you know, and you end up with saying, hey, we're here. And we then for the future state, you figure out whether you want to make one jump or you want to do three jumps. 
Now, this kind of transformation is not a short thing. This is probably going to take you at least a year. Most of our customers, it's going to take two to three years. So how do you evaluate? Well, we look at these, this, these different criteria, right? Number one, alignment with business goals. We look at the features and functions. We look at things like scalability and flexibility. Does it meet what we're doing now? Does it have the potential to meet the future? Ease of use and learning code, big, big one. We've seen several, we've seen several of our customers struggle with choosing a tool that really, the, that the employees couldn't really use that well. And they required, would require specific customization and upgrades to be able to get them to a point where it was really meeting the, the needs that is expected. Compatibility with other systems. You know, MarTech systems cannot stand alone these days, right? We need to be able to integrate with ERP, CRM, and other systems. Clearly, there's an economic factor. MarTech ranges from almost free products to open source products to freemium, all the way up to very, very expensive enterprise platforms. So figuring out what you can afford by when really is important to the to the, the vent, uh, to your roadmap. Vendor support and warranty is something, again, often underlooked, uh, uh, but you can think about, you know, that new startup with all the, the bangs and whistles and meets our requirements at a great price point. Well, what's that gonna look like, that company gonna look like in two or three years time? Will they be acquired? Will that, what happens, what will happen if they don't, you know, if, if they don't improve the product? Are you stuck with some, a technology or a platform that, is, can, that will be sort of put into stasis or is will be acquired and then you'll be forced to move to another platform. You see a, a table there? We can take these factors and put kind of various ratings on this and use this as a scorecard to be able to look more, more holistically at a particular technology or solutions. Now, what kind of technology stacks do we, what, what kind of Bartek stacks do we see? So we tend to say, three types, right? There's this kind of best of breed model, which is really an individual platform or tool that is specific for a particular need. You know, think of like a WordPress or a Contentful in terms of CMS or a HubSpot or MailChimp in terms of your email program. MoEngage as a personalization engine, Shopify from a commerce, WooCommerce, and again, from commerce perspective. And what we see is customers, what they'll do is they'll maybe mix and match. They might have a premium product for one capability and then a free product or a, or a low cost product for another one. Now, some other customers tend to move away from that best of breed. And we'll talk about why in a second to like a DXP, which is the digital experience platform. This tends to be one cup tool with a broad set of capabilities across content, marketing, commerce, analytics, et cetera. Now, there's some familiar names probably to a lot of you, Adobe, Sitecore, Kentico, Optimizely, Acquia, right? We have various platforms as well. Now, this is really the sort of the top end, and this is where the enterprise has kind of made a selection to go with a big player like a Salesforce, Microsoft, or Oracle. These are additional capabilities that get built on to their CRM platforms, to their ERP platforms, things like Sales Cloud, Marketing Cloud from Salesforce. Microsoft Customer Experience and Oracle CX. Now, why would you choose though, eat this? Well, the best of breed is tends to be they focus on that capability and you spend the money where you think your capabilities are. Now, that's a great way to think about creating that stack, but the cons tend to be integration issues, multiple mice license issues, ownership, ownership and training. Imagine your, your employees have to move from system to system to system to system, to pass data, to access things, and then have to decide which system is that capability gonna be delivered by. DXP, it's easier in some ways, single license, there's less, less integrations. A lot of the integrations are, have pre-built connectors because they're very common. Um, you have this single UI. Now, the cons are that some of those capabilities on the DPX are not as good as the best of breed. So what we still we do see is that customers may have most of the capability in a DXP, but they still might add a best of breed uh, for a particular capability because it's in critical importance to the to the customer. And then you look at the, the platforms. Think about the pros, right? You're going to leverage that investment you have, the big enterprise platforms. 
you know, they're very strong on marketing. They have a lot of systems and capabilities. The cons are you really need to be using their main suite than their ERP systems. Now, if we do this right, what does that mean? So modern MarTech will do the, deliver the following. You're looking at efficiency and productivity. You're looking at higher conversion rate. You're looking at understanding deeper customer insights, scale and agility, and then improving that campaign performance. All these things will help you drive growth. I'd like to hand it over now to Jay to talk about how AI is uh, changing MarTech. Great, thanks so much, Will. So how is AI changing MarTech? Well, it's pretty significant. And what we're gonna cover is uh, some things that Will has already covered, but these, this is how AI is taking a lot of those things to the next level. So when we're talking about uh, AI and MarTech, we're generally talking about generative AI. And as the name implies, generative AI is focused on generating content, uh, text, images, uh, actually video now, uh, lots of other types of media, audio. So, you know, unlike traditional classical AI systems, these are really that were designed for specific tasks and things, generative AI can produce a lot of original uh, and diverse outputs. And speaking of which, content generation uh, is the probably one of the best use cases for this. This can range from uh, anything from creating um, uh, creative assets, uh, creating product descriptions, video script writing for ad copy. Uh, there's all kinds of different things that we can use to generate content using generative AI. Uh, and that takes us over to uh, creative automation, where we can automate the creation of various types of content. Uh, articles, blogs, social media posts, I'll caution that while we can automate a lot of this stuff and push it directly out, really should be human reviewed still at this point. There are still hallucinations. And uh, generally speaking, uh, we always advise our customers to review what's going out uh, between before your customers see it, um, rather than sending it directly from the AI. But we can also, you know, generate content that's optimized automatically for SEO and for audience engagement. That really ensures that you know the marketing materials are, are relevant and effective in reaching you know our target target audiences. Um, personalization. It's interesting when we involve AI, really what we're talking about, we've been doing personalization for years and years, we're talking about hyper-personalization. So the ability to analyze customer data, customer history, and really deliver highly personalized marketing messages uh, and product recommendations, uh, and dynamically adjusting that content in real time based on individual customer behavior. But it also allows us to do things like really specifically tailor content, for example, to colloquial speech, cultural idioms, uh, if, the more we know about our customer, the more we're able to tailor specific messages to them using hyper-personalization. Uh, that also lends itself to better customer support. So we're all familiar with chatbots of various types. Uh, today's chatbots are not like yesterday's chatbots. They're really more true virtual assistants uh, that will prov provide you know, instant and ac hopefully accurate responses to our customer uh, inquiries uh, to you know, improve response times and customer satisfaction and really um, speak to, to our customers in a more human-like fashion than they've ever been able to do in the past. And they can also analyze, you know, past interactions to create really, again, really personalized responses uh, to really over enhance the, uh, the overall support experience. And also reduce, reduces workload on human agents and are available 24-7. Campaign optimization, we can, AI can continuously monitor and analyze campaign performance in, in real time and uh, really help us make those data-driven decisions and, and adjustments for optimal results. But it can also do some really subtle things and really identify uh, what are the most effective channels and times and messages for each target audience. So maybe a particular message and audience does really well and does terrible on a Thursday, or maybe it does really well you know, in one weather pattern and not another. But these are the types of things that AI is very, very good at, at um, pulling out those subtle patterns from from a sea of data and helping us really optimize campaigns around things that it's that it uh, it can deliver. This is a really the next one. Synthetic customers is a really exciting new category. Um, it's also known as digital twinning. Uh, this is where AI is used to actually uh, essentially create virtual. These uh, say, you know, in the, in the traditional way we would do um, uh, 
you know, customer journey, journey mapping and identifying customer segments and setting up personas, those sorts of things. We would identify those personas. We would go out and uh, hire a research team or uh, recruit some customers, sample customers to test against. But that's very limiting. You usually end up with only, you know, three to five. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming. But what if we could actually generate a very high quality simulation of that customer segment? and run a bunch of different scenarios against it. Well, we actually can. So we can, you could say, hey, I want a grandmother from the Midwest who, you know, at, th at this time of year uh, with this occupation, and it will simulate a customer with those sort of behavior patterns based on your own data. And, and of course, with the larger model data, depending on the model that you're using. So our ability to instantly generate those type of virtual customers and then run a ton of different scenarios against those is uh is pretty incredible and the the quality of the responses that we're seeing in that space is um surprisingly good so this uh and um, there's a lot of activity around doing this it's a little bit weird but surprisingly works well so talking about that uh, about digital twinning other things. Let's talk about behavioral segmentation. So AI can really, you know, analyze, you know, customer behavior and, and create really detailed segments. Again, the, the idea that it can pull more subtle patterns out of our data uh, and allow for more, you know, targeting, targeted marketing strategies around these. So because really it can identify those patterns and trends in customer actions and um, enable that personalized marketing that we were talking about. Um, for predictive scoring, you know, the ability to uh, score leads and customers and forecast their likelihood to convert or engage really helps us prioritize marketing efforts and, and ensure that, you know, resources are allocated for the most promising prospects. And that really leads us into the customer lifetime value prediction calculation. So predicting the future value of customers by analyzing the, that, the past behavior and trends and, and really aiding in strategic, strategic decision making. So that AI can enable us to identify those high value customers and, and tailor retention strategies to maximize their lifetime value. Um, speaking of retention, uh, churn prediction. So AI models are also pretty good at predicting which customers are at risk of leaving. And that allows us to really tailor um, you know, proactive retention estimate, uh, efforts. And so by identifying you know, at risk customers early, we can implement targeted interventions and, and reduce churn rates. Around sales demand and forecasting, this really could be an entire giant webinar of its own, and it, it likely will be, but AI can predict uh, future demands for products and services by analyzing a lot of different data sources, historical sales, and market trends. And by pulling all of that information together, uh, we can provide more accurate you know, sales projections and help us set realistic targets and make some uh, informed and strategic decisions. This is a very big area of activity in, in modern AI. And again, that leads us to market trends, which um, you know, AI can track and, and analyze market trends and, and offer some insights into changing customer preferences and entire industry shifts, uh, which will enable you know, us and, and any business using it to stay ahead of the competition who's not and by adapting their marketing strategies to current market conditions. So the, the bigger picture, obviously money and research and effort and tools coming out through AI or for generative AI in particular, we're seeing it integrated uh, at a deep level for a lot of different products and really gonna become, if it's not already, table stakes for pretty much any marketing uh, MarTech stack out there. So this is again, a very big area. Uh, definitely pay attention to it, and it's also rapidly changing fast. As Carlos had mentioned earlier, this is one of those disruptive technologies. So with that, Will, I will turn it back over to you to talk about that. Best practices. Correct. Okay. So what, what we've seen with, with working with all our customers is that these are the areas that, you know, again, we need to focus on. So the first one is really this need for a vision. Like this, the future state, understanding the company vision is really critical. If you're just trying to uh, solve an immediate pain point, that's okay, but it doesn't necessarily make, mean you've made a choice that will scale and grow with you as an organization. 
managing the complexity of choice. You know, often certain categories of tools aren't even looked at. Why aren't they looked at? It's because it's really this too vast, it's too complex a choice. Right sizing. It's sometimes it's easy to buy the category leader and then realize that you're overspending and not using the capability. So what we've seen before is making sure that you choose the right platform that really is going to meet your needs, that grows enough without necessarily being the Cadillac choice here. The realization that when you create, when you use these new, um, when you use these new um, tools, you're going to have to develop new skills within the organization, right? You can't assume that everyone that what we're doing today will put in a new platform and we can continue to do this. Growing your employees and bringing in new skills and talents is again a critical path. There will be new processes, new operations get the best out of these systems, sometimes you have to do, do the operations the way the systems are set up. As much as we can to customize it, to meet your needs, there is likely to have to be some new changes to really get the best out of these systems. The data silos issue, we mentioned it before, but fixing that data silos, putting in technologies that allows it easier to share customer data, customer insights across different tools and leverage those. And then finally, change management. Most of the time, you're adding a new MarTech system, upgrading a MarTech system, there is going to be a fair amount of change. And we have to embrace that change, understand that change, and work with the employees to be able to say, these are the changes that are coming, and make sure that we co-create and involve them through the selection and the rollout of the new platform. Now, I would also say, when you're thinking about selecting a partner, look for the following things, as well as skills with the platform and the ability to do this. Does the partner, can they help you with building capability within your organization? Can they understand your organization? Can they work with you? Can they give you best practices? Can they, they help you to say, this is the way we should set up this system, configure this system. This is what your organization should look like. These are the kinds of skills you need to have. Can we help? Does, do they have a change management practice? You're going to rely on a partner to help you with change management. I think it's a very, very important part of any kind of system rollout and any MarTech plan. Can they provide training? Do they have people that are ex experts in that platform? They can provide the training and support that you need. Can they provide technical support? You know, do they have managed services that can actually operate this for you? What we're sort of seeing is that as the, these systems get more and more complex, there is more and more needs. And you may say, hey, can I outsource some of this capability and some of these tasks to a partner? If you think about security, you think about continuous improvement. Do they have the ability to not only just implement it once, but then help you with that roadmap to continue to improve your MarTech, your operations, et cetera, et cetera. And then do you have somebody that sort of looking at what's happening in the market, know what those product roadmaps are for all these platforms, can give you insights and trends about what is happening in MarTech and what you should be looking out for and how you should be changing. Now, you know, how can Synoptic help? Well, Synoptic has three major areas. We, we help with customers with envisioning, a lot of which we we're talking about today, but we also have capabilities to deliver, deploy, configure, set up your MarTech systems. And then ultimately, also, we can help you operate that, whether it's marketing operations, content operations, um, whether it's continuous improvement, helping you put upgrades, integrations, et cetera, et cetera, making sure that we can make sure that your operations continue to improve on the platforms you've chosen. Now, we're also offering a complimentary one hour consultation. This consultation um, can be in, on any one of these domains uh, that we've spoken about today from content marketing, e-commerce, digital marketing, et cetera. Um, you can see a QR code there. Please feel free to scan that code or use the, or we will be sharing the link. Um, and this will allow you to fill in a form and get us a one hour meeting. That one hour meeting, you can ask us specific questions about your current stack, or we can ask you, or we can ask about 
you know, you're interested in knowing more about a particular technology. We can give you some recommendations, some best practices, and then talk to you about, you know, what potential next steps will be. So we hope you would take, take us up on that one hour um, consultation, but please let us know. Thank you. And we wanted to let you know about a few uh, or a couple of upcoming webinars, um, both uh, ones in August and ones of se September. And since you joined this session, we thought you'd be interested in our reimagine customer engagement in the age of AI webinar. Go ahead and either scan that um, QR code or you can find the link directly from our website in our events and webinars tab and you can watch live. I'm going to open it up for uh, some questions and let's see, we'll take a few questions before we wrap up and you can drop those in the Q&A section now. Okay, so we have a, we have a few. All right, what are a few technology trends to watch in the martech industry yeah so the two that i would focus on that and i'm sure my colleagues will give a a, a different answer would be the uh, would be personalization engines and customer data platforms both of them are sort of interlinked um, when we look at things like cdps like segment um, there's a whole you know that's a, a very powerful um, customer data platform for integrating all your different customer data sources and allowing you to segment and then sending those to different channels to allow you to, to drive uh, personalization. Um, your personalization platforms, uh, I would look at things like, in, uh, I think there's a lot of innovation going around uh, companies like Insider and MoEngage, uh, where they're really bringing that customer data platform and the only channel personalization together. Uh, these tools are very powerful. They have they have very good um, sort of pre-built um, pre-built campaigns that allow you to quickly see return, um, and I think that these ones are you know anyone should be who's interested in in sort of like improving their personalization should look at those uh, those those platforms. Yeah, I think I, I could add to that as well. <clears throat> well, I think the other two would be one one of them is decomposable Martech stacks. It's essentially a best of breed play for companies wanting to avoid vendor lock-in and also have a more customized needs. And uh, the DXPs have modularized their Martech stacks into individual components such as CRM, CMS, analytics, et cetera. And it's really designed to seamlessly interoperate with their own platform, obviously, but also with other vendor platforms. And it gives you the flexibility to change out uh, components and only, of course, select the components that you really, really need. And then the other would be omnichannel journey analytics. So it's not just about the journey analytics on digital properties, but goes into call centers. Um, it's really about giving you a 360 degree view of your customer. And the more insights you have into the customer from an experience perspective, their challenges and behavior, the more you're gonna be able to optimize your marketing strategies and tactics. Thanks. All right, this is a, an interesting one. What are the consequences for not taking any action and continue with our current course? Yeah, so there's a certain amount of like uh, tech debt here. Um, you know, you see that the, 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 as the competition and the experiences continue to enroll, um, yes, you're going to be competing with like with your, with your competitors that will continue to involve these channels and make them more personalized, make them more targeted, improve conversion, get greater insights. And as we've seen with many of our customers, it's the operations have to change. Doing business the way you've already done, always done business is probably going to hurt you in this time because there is a huge disruption and customers are going to go to the, you know, the channel of sort of lowest friction. So if I need to, in order to buy from you, I have to make sure that I can call somebody and that person is available, not available at the time I need them, but I can, versus competition, I can go online, I can transact and understand what, get my product in there. 
that is going to be a competitive advantage. You know, and then every year you wait, those legacy systems you have are always are going to get further and further out of date, and you're going to be losing that digital opportunity. Right. All right. <clears throat> All right, a couple more have come in and you're welcome to continue adding your question here and we'll definitely try to get to it. If we don't, then we will follow up with you directly. Let's see here. Um, all right, you mentioned customer journey map. Can you explain more about it? Yeah, so customer journey map is a, is a, a way of um, plotting the future, I mean, either the current state or the future state customer journey. So you start with who is the actor? What is the journey they're trying to take? We'll look at the different phases, right? So if you think about a typical journey, right? There's a kind of an awareness phase. There's a consideration phase. There's a conversion phase. There may be an onboarding phase. And you can think about all those different phases. And then you determine what is the what are the used customer actions? What do they want? to know at that particular point and how do they feel about it you know are they overwhelmed are they anxious are they excited and then then we we look at it and say what are the opportunities at each phase for an interaction at that point and what is that channel we use this to be able to understand particularly the digital technologies but also how these technologies can enhance all the interactions whether it's from call center whether it's from a salesperson or it's through an automated system like an e-commerce platform. So leveraging the, you know, this is a great way of getting all your stakeholders together and memorializing the experience together. And then everyone has an understanding within the organization of what is the experience we either have or the experience we intend to build. So one of the difficulties in delivering a great customer experience is, is, um, is really about organizational alignment. Uh, you'd be surprised uh, sometimes it almost feels that uh, the different teams are not talking to one another internally. And customer journey mapping puts the focus on the customer and everyone around uh, organized around how to facilitate and streamline and remove friction from the process. And um, it's amazing that apart from the actual digital strategies and enhancements that come out of that, it really causes uh, a lot of alignment internally in the organization and increased customer focus. Yeah, and, and these, these journey maps can be used as an artifact, right? To sort of like pin on the wall of both the IT department, the marketing department, the sales department, and say, this is the journey we're building, right? And it really is around that other, you know, because, you know, journeys traditionally will go across those organizational barriers. And therefore, we want to know what the state the customer's in, and then what do they come in at the end? Perfect. We also had a question around um, aligning MarTech modernization with business goals. We are at time. So why don't um, we, you know, talk about that in the follow-up. And then if you want to, if you're interested in, knowing uh, that about your business goal, um, and it looks like a couple of you are, we can definitely um, have the uh, uh, more one-on-one -on -one conversations with you. Um, so thank you all for joining today's session on, our, on modernizing your MarTech stack to drive engagement, growth, and customer satisfaction. We explored how to understand the world of MarTech and provide ideas on how you can transform your customer experiences by leveraging the power of these powerful tools. If you would like to continue the conversation or are interested in taking advantage of our complimentary MarTech consultation session or um, a shorter meeting with us, uh, you still have the opportunity to do so. Go ahead and complete the form that's um, in our session or follow-up email, um, or just get in contact with us, with us directly. Lastly, be sure to keep an eye out on your inbox for a follow-up email with resources related to this webinar. And until next time, take care and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.